Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, speaking with you today about um, a type of modeling that is probably new to the pharmaceutical industry, uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, or CFD, and talking about how you can use these models um, for complex uh, generic drugs and how you can establish credibility. So what can you do with the CFD model for complex generic drugs? Um, so the, the primary use for this type of model is to, it serves as a way to connect your in vitro metrics with your in vivo performance. And this would be for any kind of process that's uh, governed by fluid behavior. So what is it? It's a modeling uh, procedure that allows for prediction of uh, fluid and particle transport. And it allows for consideration of realistic geometries so say if you have a drug-device combination, um, you can actually consider differences in device in this type of modeling. So I just want to give an example of what the results from a simulation look like. Uh, this is from an internal project uh, looking at a topical formulation for toenails. Um, so what we're trying to look at is what's the difference in toenail penetration according to surface tension and also viscosity. So you can see from the little animation that some of the fluid is retained um, <clears throat> underneath the toenail and some of it runs off. So if you vary these in vitro metrics, you can quantify what's the difference in what you think your in vivo performance is. So how do you uh, solve an actual CFD model? So these are based on what are called the Navier-Stokes uh, equations of fluid motion. These are uh, first, first principle-based uh, physics equations. And so what you do is you take your domain, which could be um, lung, could be skin surface, could be whatever part of the body that you're interested in, and you divide it into smaller volumes. And so your mesh route refers to your, this collection of volumes. <clears throat> and then depending on how many volumes you have, that's what's called your mesh density. So this is an image of what this might look like. So this is for a lung model where you have a few different branching um, <clears throat> uh, airways. And if you look closely, you can see that there's these little kind of boxes in there. So that would be your, your volumes, and your collection of volumes would be so how are these actually useful? So these can be used for product development, much like PBBK, where if you have a model earlier in your, your, your development, you can use it to guide your um, device changes, especially for something like uh, orally inhaled drug products, where you want to know if I change my device, what's going to be the difference on particle size distribution. Uh, a good CFD model may be capable of doing that, um, so it can save you some money early in the process. Um, it's also uh, capable of supporting an alternative BE approach. Um, so it could be used uh, in place of a, a PD uh, or comparative clinical endpoint study, uh, probably most effectively with a combination of other studies, uh, in vitro studies, maybe even with a PBBK model as well. <coughs> uh, other things that it can do is it can inform um, the choice of your uh, in vitro test specifications. Also, you can uh, characterize the impact of excipient differences in Describe a case example for that in a little bit. So, okay, you've decided maybe a CFD model could be helpful to me, but how do I know that this model is worth anything? So credibility in this uh, case is your confidence in your model's ability to predict what you're interested in. So there's really not any one unanimous uh, standard, uh, but there is a recently released standard from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers uh, which I think is an interesting standard and could be useful if you're looking to use this type of model. Um, so uh, for short, it's called the ASME VNV40 uh, standard. Um, so it's intended for medical devices, um, but it could also be used for complex generic drug products, many of which also include devices as well. <coughs> so what are some concepts based on this um, standard? Uh, so there's your context of use. So that would be, what's the question that you're trying to address, and how much are you actually going to use your model to uh, address it? And when you consider your context of use, then you want to consider how risky is it to use your model. And by, to determine that, it's a combination of model influence and decision consequence. So decision consequence would be something like, um, say, you're supporting an alternative B approach for an oral inhaled drug product, and say that we made a bad decision you have an, an OIDP that goes on the market and it, it's lacking in safety or efficacy. Well, that would be an extremely high decision consequence in that case, right? <clears throat> um, and then your model influence would be how much did your, how much of a role did your model actually play in making 
So even if you have a high risk uh, decision in, according to decision consequence, if your model is not really used a lot, then you could consider the model itself to be low risk. Um, and I'm going to get into uh, these terms here at the bottom, verification and validation a little later. So I want to go through a couple of examples of how you would think about your context of use and how you would determine risk for how you're using your model. So say you want to make a formulation change for a dry powder inhaler. And you want to know uh, which batch of lactose should I choose. Um, we know that different batches of lactose can change all sorts of things, including particle size distribution. <clears throat> so if you have a CFD model, which is actually capable of predicting this, um, this might prevent uh, repetition of these PSD tests trying to get that batch right. Hopefully you can get it right the first time. And um, we do actually have a couple of internal grants, which I'll mention later, which are trying to develop models that are capable of doing this. So in this case, I would say your decision consequence is low, because if you're wrong, you're just going to repeat your test, which you were about to do anyway. So your model was just hopefully going to help you. But if it doesn't, then it, it didn't hurt you too much. Um, and maybe your model influence is medium, because you really are leaning on your model somewhat to make your decision. So I would say low medium in this case. So another example would be justify a BE approach that doesn't include a PD study. So like I mentioned before, what if you have an OIDP and you want to substitute, say, a CFD model combined with a PVBK model where the CFD is predicting deposition, PVBK is predicting your absorption, um, and you want to show that you don't need to do a PD study. So in this case, decision consequence would most likely be high. And your model influence would also be high, because you're pretty much relying on the model to make this decision. So we would call it high, high. So this is a, a very high risk model. OK, so going a little further into how do you show that this model is actually um, useful for your, your intended purpose. Now you know what's your context of use, how risky is the model. Um, and you can imagine, with more risk, you're going to want more evidence to show that it's um, a credible model versus if it's less risky. Um, so there's verification, um, somewhat similar to what uh, LF, uh, Dr. Sakoloju uh, mentioned previously. Um, so this would be looking at um, either code, um, so saying uh, how well does your numerical approximation um, actually uh, represent your equations, or calculation. Um, I was showing the mesh earlier, so um, that would be something like how dense does your mesh need to be. Uh, and I'll show a couple examples of this later. Uh, validation, that would be more like comparing your model. You have your comparator, which would be your experimental data, um, and you assess how closely these are to each other. So how well does your model actually represent reality? And then applicability, uh, does your model actually represent what you're trying to measure? And how relevant is your validation to your model? So uh, go a little bit further into code verification. Um, so like I said, this is to ensure adequate numerical accuracy. So I want to discuss an example from an internal project where we have a passive diffusion model that's part of a larger model. So I, I want to assess how well does my model actually model passive diffusion. So I took a, um, a two-dimensional space, um, and I specified zero flux on the top and zero concentration on the side. So this was what the CFD result looked like. And so what I'm going to do is uh, compare the analytical result. So I actually have an analytical set of equations uh, at the very top part of this, and if I had a Pointer, I would kind of point at it, but at the very top, I'm um, going to compare those two. So what were the results? So I, like I said, I looked at the top side. I varied a few things, the diffusion coefficient, the size of the mesh, the time step. And um, if you look at the graph, this was for the, the higher density mesh. And the analytical is almost on top of the CFD, except for right at the boundaries. So as long as you know in your simulation maybe your boundaries is not as important, then this should be adequate. And I determined that, in this case, the smaller mesh was adequate. So calculation verification. Um, I mentioned this is looking at a mesh. Um, so uh, one of our contractors was gracious enough to share some of their results uh, from a mesh uh, sensitivity study. So what you're looking at is, if you're increasing your mesh size, how many of these little volumes that you have in your geometry, that's what mesh is, um, how is that affecting your results? So you don't want it to affect your result. It's not something that's physically real. So you want it to be separate from your result. Um, also temporal, so your time step if you're um, simulating in time. Um, and usually what you do is you have a, a pre-specified tolerance. So you say, I'm going to keep making my mesh bigger until it doesn't change by 1% or 5% or something like that. So what were their results from their mesh de density study? Uh, they, so they had three different mesh sizes. 
um, and they were looking at re regional deposition. This was from a nasal um, suspension spray. And so they concluded that the, uh, for deposition, the total, total deposition, the middle mesh was adequate. So if you look at this bar graph, that's the, the largest value right there is the total deposition. You see it doesn't really change too much from one mesh to the next. Um, but if you're looking at regional deposition, especially those two smaller ones right there, which are the um, nasopharynx and the oropharynx, even from the middle to the top mesh, they're still changing quite a bit. So really, if you want to go further and predict regional deposition, you should keep going. You should have an even higher density mesh. So this would not be complete if you wanted to do regional de deposition. So validation. There's a couple ways you can do this. One way would be in vitro. Um, so most of, and I wanted to add that most of the things I'm talking about today are orally inhaled drug products because that's where CFD is probably most established so far. But it, it can be useful for other drug products as well. So just because I'm talking about OIDPs doesn't mean that you can't use it for dermal or ophthalmic um, or even uh, opioid abuse deterrent formulations or, or we've been trying to expand in those areas as well. But this is for oily inhaled drug products. Um, so for an oily inhaled drug product, you could have a rapid prototype model of your, um, uh, say, nasal cavity, lung geometry, what have you. And then in this case, what they did was they took uh, monodispersed particle distributions. So it, your particles are all about the same size. And they measure the deposition in, in your realistic geometry. Um, and then they um, simulate it, and then they compare the two. So you can see a, a pretty good match here. Another way that you can do it is with something uh, called gamma scintigraphy. Uh, so this is where you take a radio-labeled aerosol and you're actually um, measuring where is the, using a 2D representation, of where is the drug landing in your lung. So it, you can infer your sort of central versus peripheral deposition. And in this case, they compared it with their simulation. They found pretty good results. So um, this would probably be preferable. So I do in vivo versus in vitro, but obviously it's harder to get that kind of data. So in vitro can also be certainly a very useful tool. And for either approach, I think one thing that would be very useful to, is very useful to do is uncertainty quantification. So that means, say, I don't know with any great precision what my uh, breathing flow rate was for these studies. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to vary my uh, inlet flow rate and then see how does that really af affect my results. So that gives me a sense for um, how good my parameter estimates are. So I'm going to draw some uh, broader conclusions. Um, so CFD is something that you can use for either product development or for um, alternative BE approaches. Uh, ASME VMV40 is something I, I reviewed. It's not the only standard you could use. You could use um, uh, some other standard that you, you find or even one that you think is appropriate. But this is just a useful one that I decided to focus on for this talk. Uh, so verification and validation, I showed a couple of case examples. Um, so they require some careful consideration to, to use them successfully. And uh, so if you have a credible model, it may possibly be used to support um, an alternative B approach. Um, and uh, like I think everybody said for the last two days, I'll repeat it myself. Um, if you have an alternative B approach, please talk to us um, beforehand, and we can help um, answer any questions and help you with your model. Um, and maybe one last thing to say about that is that most likely if you're going to use a model like this, you're going to go through a consultant. Um, so it's good to understand this, um, this kind of thinking, model credibility, before you reach out to your consultant. So that if you're um, going through a consultant, you're, you're guiding that process. You're making sure that they are building a credible model and giving you something that's going to be useful. So I want to acknowledge some of the people um, in our office, many who you've seen the last few days. Also, we have uh, other collaborators throughout the FDA, um, even in CDRH. Um, and I mentioned some of our contractors here from VCU. They shared some results. And also from North Carolina State University. And finally, I just want to end with a few of our ongoing grants and contracts. Um, I mentioned before we have the, the grants um, from Princeton and Sydney, where, as you can see here, that are developing um, for dry powder inhaler, how can you predict um, these uh, differences in particle size, say, for different carrier particle um, batches? Um, we have a number of other um, interesting projects as well, um, both looking at nasal and um, uh, lung delivery. So uh, that's the end. And I hope that this modeling uh, uh, type, CFD models, is something that can be useful for your uh, product development.